Hello? I am Russell Earl Kelly. What I'm about to present is an adaptation of my essay, Tithing is Not a Christian Doctrine. And the essay is from my book, Should the Church Teach Tithing? A Theologian's Conclusions About a Taboo Doctrine. And the book is from my PhD thesis on the subject. The materials and the text for this study can be found on my website, www.shouldthechurchteachtithing.com. It is my purpose to stimulate in Bible seminary studies in the master's, the doctorate, and the Ph.D. levels, studies on tithing. In my opinion, this is simply a too important a doctrine to ignore. Tithing today is reaching the levels, I believe, of a modern scandal. Whereas most churches in the United States did not even teach it before the 1870s, and whereas theological seminaries barely mention it in their books, Studies of Hermeneutics and Systematic Theology, it is becoming a requirement in most churches to hold church office. And even in some churches, it is becoming a requirement for church membership. A statement from a large conservative church in the United States reads, Tithing is the minimum biblical standard and the beginning point which God has established that must not be replaced or compromised by any other standard. Tithing is the minimum biblical standard and the beginning point which God has established that must not be replaced or compromised by any other standard. And this statement is followed by another statement which says tithing is an expectation from church members from their gross income before taxes. What I am going to present is what I believe the Bible teaches about tithing in contrast with this statement we have just heard. Essay point number one. New Covenant giving principles in 2 Corinthians chapters 8 and 9 are superior to tithing. New Covenant giving principles in 2 Corinthians chapters 8 and 9 are superior to tithing. I sincerely believe this to be true. They are, number one, give yourself to God first. If you're not a child of God, no amount of giving will help you. Give yourself to knowing God's will. Give in response to Christ's gift. Give out of a sincere desire. Do not give because of any commandment. Give beyond your ability. Give to produce equality. For many Christians, that means more than 10%, but for many, it also means less than 10%. The New Covenant has this equality principle. It evens out in the end. Give joyfully. Give because you are growing spiritually. Give because you want to continue growing spiritually. And finally, give because you're hearing the gospel preached. Those are the new covenant giving principles found in 2 Corinthians chapters 8 and 9. Essay point number two. In God's word, the tithe is always only food. In God's word, the tithe is always only food. This is a fundamental Bible truth that affects every text in the Word of God where tithing is mentioned. And we must keep it in mind in order to understand God's Word. 
I urge you to get a concordance, a complete Bible concordance, and do some study for yourself. Don't take my word for it. Don't take your pastor's word for it. Do your own research. Use the Word of God and look up every single reference to the word tithe, the word tithes, the word tithing, and even the word tenth. You'll discover, as I did, that there are 16 different verses in the Word of God that contain the contents of the tithe. And the contents is always only food. It is never money. Money existed in the book of Genesis and in the, in the Pentateuch, yet money is never considered a tithable item in the Word of God. The Bible defines tithes in these 16 verses in this way. True biblical tithes were always only food, only from farms and herds, of only Israelites who only lived in God's holy land, the boundary of Israel, only under Old Covenant terms, and the increase could only be gathered from what God increased. Again, true biblical tithes were always only food, only from farms and herds, of only Israelites who only lived inside God's holy land, the boundary of Israel, only under old covenant conditions, and the increase could only be gathered from what God miraculously increased. This definition is fundamental to understanding the, the doctrine of tithing in the Word of God. Essay point number three. Money was an essential non-tithed item in Genesis. Money was an essential non-tithed item in Genesis. The argument is presented that tithes were always used as money in the Old Testament because money was very rare indeed and the barter system required food to be used to purchase items. That argument is not biblical. In fact, the word money occurs 32 times in Genesis alone. The word money occurs 44 times before the tithe is first mentioned in Leviticus 27. And money occurs 62 times in the first five books of the Bible. The word shekel also occurs 32 times in the Pentateuch. Money paid for land. Abraham bought land with money, not with food. Money bought slaves. Money was used by slaves to buy their freedom. Money was required to pay judicial fines, not food. Money was required to pay sanctuary dues, poll taxes, and head taxes. Money was required in many vows that were made by the people. It was repaid in monetary value. Alcoholic drinks were purchased with money. And marriage dowries very often included money in the earliest books of the Bible. We even find banking laws and laws against high interest and usury in the book of Leviticus even before tithing is mentioned. Therefore, it is wrong to say that money was not a tithable item because it was not an essential everyday item. Money was very essential even in the book of Genesis. Therefore, the argument 
that money did not exist and therefore it could not be included at the tithable item is wrong. Essay point number four. Abraham's tithe to Melchizedek in Genesis 14 was probably an example of pagan tradition. Abraham's tithe to Melchizedek in Genesis 14 was probably an example of pagan Arab tradition. Abraham's tithe is not an example for Christians to follow and for the church. I want to give you 11 reasons for this statement. Number one, Abraham did not freely tithe. Your preacher might say so. Your evangelist may say so. Even some commentaries may say so. But the Word of God does not say that Abraham freely chose to tithe. Number two, Abraham's gift was not a holy tithe. That which Abraham gave to Melchizedek from the spoils of war does not fit the biblical definition of tithe at all, and it would not have been accepted as a tithe under the Mosaic law. Number three, Abraham's tithe was pagan. What Abraham tithed came from Sodom and Gomorrah in that area of the world. He retrieved it from pagan Babylonians. And at least the 90% of what he retrieved was returned to pagans in Sodom and Gomorrah. His tithe was purely a pagan custom. Number four. Numbers 31 set spoils of war at 1%. If you're going to compare apples to apples and oranges to oranges, then you need to see what the Word of God teaches is required as a tithe from spoils of war. And it is not 10%, it is 1% in Numbers chapter 31. Number five, Abraham's tithe was a one-time recorded event. The Word of God does not record, record an instance of Abraham ever tithing again to anybody. Number six, Abraham's tithe was not his property. The Bible does not say that Abraham ever paid a tithe from his own personal property. Is that an example for Christians to follow? Number seven, Abraham kept nothing for himself. He gave 10% of the spoils of war to the king of Jerusalem, and he gave the other 90% of the spoils of war to the king of Sodom. Is that an example for Christians to follow? Number eight, Abraham's tithe is not quoted anywhere in the Bible to promote tithing. You would think if Abraham's tithe were so important that Moses somewhere in the law would have referred to it or quoted it to support tithing. When it is quoted in Hebrews chapter 7, it is merely a vehicle to prove that Melchizedek was greater than Abraham and Aaron. And Aaron. Point number nine, Genesis 14, verse 21, not verse 20, verse 21 is the key text to understanding Genesis 14. If you look this up in commentaries, you'll be surprised as I was that more than half of the commentaries say that the 90%, the 90% in verse 21 was governed by pagan Arab tradition. Point number 10. 10% 10 to God, 90% to Sodom, or to Satan. Is that an example for Christians to follow today? Point number 11. 
As priests themselves, and the head of the household, Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob traveled their land a lot. If they gave a tithe at all, it was following the custom that they would give food at the altars they built for Yahweh. There is no example of tithing as we see it in the Mosaic Law or in the Christian Church from the example in Genesis 14. Essay point number five. Tithing was not a minimum standard requirement from all Old Covenant Israelites. Tithing was not a minimum standard requirement from all Old Covenant Israelites. Yet every single tithe teacher I hear or see or read today assumes falsely that everybody in Israel was required to begin their giving standard, their giving level, at 10%. By assuming this, they then assume falsely that well, since the New Testament church has higher principles, that Christians today should also at the least begin their giving level at 10%. The assumption is wrong because of the definition of tithing in God's Word. The only people in the Old Testament in God's Word who were required to begin their giving level at 10% were the farmers and the herdsmen. The others were not required to do so at all. They did not fit under the definition of tithing. And the tithe could only properly come from inside God's holy land of Israel. The increase of the tithe came from God's hand, from God's miracle. God produced, provided the increase from which tithes were given. On the other hand, the increase of those who earn their living not from the land, in crafts, in trades, and other skills, was something that their hands provided, and therefore God did not require them to tithe something that they produced. Essay point number six. Levitical tithes were received by the Levites who were only servants to the priests. Levitical tithes were received by the Levites who were only servants to the priests. Why, you ask, is this so important? It is important because this biblical principle of tithing is not followed by any New Covenant church today. It is completely ignored as if it never existed. In the Old Covenant, God told the people to bring the tithes not to the priest, but to the Levites. And the Levites were only the servants to the priest. And the Levites, in turn, gave only one-tenth of the tenth they received, one percent of the total, to the priest. We read this in Numbers chapter 18, verses 26 and 28. Thus speaking to the Levites, you shall offer up even a tenth part of the tithe, and you shall give thereof the Lord's heave offering to Aaron the priest. Therefore the text clearly says that the Levites, the servants to the priest, had the tithe, and they only gave to the priest a tenth of the tithe, one percent. We see this also found in Nehemiah chapter 10, verse 38. And the priest, the son of Aaron, shall be with the Levites when the Levites take tithes. And the Levites shall bring up the tithe of the tithe unto the house of our God, to the chambers into the treasure house. This is clear, that the Levites took the tithes from the people. And the Levites gave a tenth of the tithe to the priest. 
And God's word makes it clear also that it was the responsibility not of the people but of the Levites and the priests to bring portions of the tithe to the temple as it was required. And we see that in other verses. The people did not were not required to bring the tithes to the temple. They brought them to the Levites and priests. Another thing we see in Numbers 18 is the concept of inheritance. An old covenant principle of tithing said that those who receive the first whole tithe were not allowed to own or inherit property in God's holy land in exchange for receiving the tithe. Yet today, strangely, preachers want the whole tithe that went to the Levites, they want the tenth of the tithe that went to the priest, and they also expect and often do own and inherit vast properties in stark contrast to the principles of the Word of God. Numbers 18, verse 20, God is addressing the priest. And the Lord spoke unto Aaron, Thou shalt have no inheritance in their land, neither shalt thou have any part among them. I am thy part and thine inheritance among the children of Israel. And again in verse 23, he's speaking to the Levites. But the Levites shall do the service of the tabernacle of the congregation, and they shall bear their iniquity. It shall be a statute forever throughout your generations that among the children of Israel they have no inheritance. Friends, where is this principle gone today? In the Old Covenant, if you receive the first tithe, you are not allowed to own or inherit property. Churches today want the first tithe, they want the tenth of the tenth, and they want to own and inherit vast amounts of property. They want their cake, and they want to eat it too. Essay point number seven. The phrase, it is holy to the Lord, in Leviticus 27, does not make tithing an eternal moral principle. The phrase, it is holy to the Lord, in Leviticus 27, does not make tithing an eternal moral principle. Yet, when I hear tithe teachers today, they all quote Leviticus 27, and they leave out certain portions of the verses to suit their own purposes, and they quote these verses to show that tithing is called holy to the Lord. And their logic is that since tithing is called holy to the Lord, it must be an eternal moral principle. And therefore, it carries over from the Old Covenant into the New Covenant. There are serious problems with that interpretation from the Word of God. I want us to read Leviticus chapter 27, verses 30 to 33. And all the tithe of the land, whether of the seed of the land, or of the fruit of the tree, is the Lord's. It is holy unto the Lord. And if a man will at all redeem any part of his tithes, he shall add thereto the fifth part thereof. And concerning the tithe of the herd, or of the flock, even of whatsoever passes under the rod, the tenth shall be holy unto the Lord. He shall not search whether it be good or bad, neither shall he change it. And if he change it at all, then both it and the change thereof shall be holy. It shall not be redeemed. There are four errors in these four verses that the errors are preached on today from churches across the land. The first error they commit is they change the definition of the word tithe to include money and things that man has produced. 
the biblical definition from these texts themselves, from the context itself, is that the tithe was the tithe of the food of the land and of the herds and nothing else. The second error preachers commit when they quote these verses is that they call the tithe the first fruits. They probably want to make sure they get theirs first. The verses clearly say that the tithe is the tenth. The word tithe means tenth. The word first means first. And tithes and first fruits are not the same thing in the Word of God. A third mistake preachers make from these verses is to call the tithe the best. The verses clearly say that the tithe is the tenth, whether it is good or bad. Yet preachers ignore this and call and act like all the tithes are the first fruits and the best that should be brought to the churches. Another thing that preachers distort when they teach these texts is the meaning of the terms holy and most holy. These texts are in the last five verses of Leviticus. For 27 chapters, God has discussed everything in Leviticus, and almost everything in those 27 chapters is called either holy or most holy. Yet the church looks at all of these other things, and the vast majority of them they reject as being fulfilled or irrelevant or not relating to the Christian church at all. Where is your principle of interpretation? What gives you the right to say that all of these things that are holy and most holy are no longer relevant, but tithing is, as if tithing somehow exists apart and separate from the rest of the book of Leviticus? A fifth thing from these verses that preachers don't mention is verse 34, the last verse in the book of Leviticus. These are the commandments which the Lord commanded Moses for the children of Israel in Mount Sinai. These are the commandments which the Lord commanded Moses for the children of Israel in Mount Sinai. Tithing like the rest of Leviticus and the rest of the Old Covenant was only given to national Israel. It was their covenant. In fact, several times God told Israel not to share its covenant with anybody else. And the proof is that the Gentiles were not allowed to bring tithes to the temple. Therefore, these five verses in Leviticus reveal five errors taught by churches today concerning tithing. They simply want you to think that all of these ver the only thing these verses teach is that the tithe is holy to the Lord and nothing else seems to matter. Essay point number eight. First fruits are not the same as tithes. First fruits are not the same as tithes. I mentioned this already when we looked at Leviticus 27. In the Word of God, tithes were small, the, the, the first fruits were small token offerings given by Israel to God. The first fruits were small enough that they could be put in a small basket and carried by hand, by one hand, by one man, to the temple. In Deuteronomy chapter 26, verses 1 to 10, is a discussion of the first fruits. In verse 1 we read, When you have come into the land, this important principle of tithing is ignored by the church that in the Old Covenant it was not a tithe, no matter how good it was, if it did not come out of the holy 
land of Israel, God's land. Even an Israelite who lived outside of Israel could not bring food or herd or animals that he had raised off the land of Israel. It would not have been accepted. Verse 2, we read, That you shall take of the first of all the fruit of the earth and put it in a basket and shall go into the place. In verse 4, And the priest shall take the basket out of your hand. So the first fruits were very, very small indeed and not tithes at all. The Anglican scholar Alfred Edersheim in his book Sketches on Jewish Social Life says that when a person from a distant village was going to the temple that he would often gather all of the first fruits for the entire village and put on one pack animal and carry to the temple at one time. And you cannot say this is true of tithing, of tithes. Another text that makes this very clear is found in Nehemiah chapter 10, verses 35 through 37. In verses 35 to 37, the people are commanded to take the first fruits of the land, of the trees, the firstborn of the herd, the first of the, of the bread and of the wine, to the temple, to the priest, to the storehouse, to feed those priests who were ministering there at that particular time. And they were not allowed to bring those first fruits out of the temple. They had to consume them in the temple. On the other hand, the same verse, verse 37, says, And the tithes bring to the Levitical cities for the Levites, that they may have the tithes in all their lands. So three verses tell us that the first fruits went to the temple. And one verse tells us that the tithes went to the Levitical cities for the Levites and the priests. They are not the same thing in God's word. And friends, it is wrong to teach that the tithes are the first fruits in the Bible. The, the only exception is the tenth of the tithe was called a best, but not even it was not called a first fruit. And preachers seem to on and on and on, call first fruits the tithe. I don't understand it unless there's an ulterior motive there that we just have to say is wrong. Essay point number nine. There are four different tithes described in the Bible. There are four different tithes described in the Bible. The first tithe in the Bible is called the Levitical tithe, and we've discussed that already. The first whole tithe was given by the people to the Levites who were not the priests. They were the servants of the priest. And the Levites, in turn, gave one-tenth of what they received, the best tenth of the tenth, to the priest. Therefore, the priests received one percent of the total tithe. A second tithe is called the festival tithe or the feast tithe. This tithe was brought once a year to the streets of Jerusalem during the three annual feasts and it was eaten in the streets of Jerusalem by all the people and they shared it as a potluck and they shared it with the strangers and the Levites and the priests. A third tithe is called the poor tithe or the third year tithe. Every third year, the people were commanded to keep a, a third tithe at the homes of the individual Israelites. And they shared them with the poor and the Levites as they came around to their homes. So none of the first three tithes, the first, the Levitical tithe, the feast tithe, and the poor tithe, were taken 
directly to the temple by the people, and only a small portion of the first tithe ever ended up in the temple. A fourth tithe, which is actually the first, first tithe because it was the best, was the king's tithe. In 1 Samuel chapter 8, when Israel decided they wanted a king, the Bible tells us that the king would take the first and the best and the tenth, not only of the crops, but of the people and everything they had. Therefore, the king got his tithe first, and that pushes all the other three tithes a little bit further down the echelon. It is surprising that these four tithes are not mentioned from the pulpits of our churches. You hear of one tithe of 10% most of the time. And even then, the pastors want the whole first tithe, which they didn't get in the Old Testament. They want the tenth of the tithe, the best, which was only 1% of the tithe in the Old Testament. And they also want to own and inherit vast properties, which tithe receivers were not allowed to own in the Old Testament. Those are the four tithes from the Old Testament. Essay point number 10. Jesus, Peter, Paul, the poor, and the Gentiles did not tithe. Jesus, Peter, Paul, the poor, and the Gentiles did not tithe. This is because we must apply the strict, narrow, biblical definition of tithes of being land, food from the land and herds of Israel and only from inside Israel. Jesus was a carpenter. What carpenters made and produced was from their own skills, their own hands, their own increase. And that does not qualify under the definition of the biblical tithing. Paul was a tent maker. Most of what Paul made, he made from skins and he sold in marketplaces outside of Israel. In the first place, the products that Paul made were not tithable items. In the second place, where Paul made those items and sold those items were outside the Holy Land of Israel. Paul could bring free will offerings from those products, but they were disqualified as items that could be tithed upon. Peter was a fisherman. The Word of God nowhere tells us that fishermen ever brought tithes of fish they caught to the Levites and the priests in the form of tithing. The fish did not belong to in the category of tithable items. It would be very difficult to place them there because of the, the characteristics of what fish ate and the, the source the fish came from. The poor did not tithe. Usually after two or three generations of the biblical application of the double portion of the land to the firstborn, most of the Israelites were pushed off of the land. They either worked as day laborers for their relatives, in which case their relatives who owned the land paid the tithe, or they migrated to the cities and took up crafts and trades, in which the products of crafts and trades were not tithable items. Therefore, the poor did not tithe, and neither did the Gentiles tithe. The Gentiles themselves in the Old Testament were considered unclean. They themselves were unclean. Everything they touched was unclean. A Gentile could not breathe, bring a tithe to the, to the Levites and priests and, and offer it to them. It would not have been accepted as a tithe. <clears throat> Therefore, it is wrong to teach that the Old Covenant started with everybody having to pay a tithe. The false assumption I mentioned earlier is totally wrong. The Bible does not teach that everybody in the Old Covenant was required to begin their giving level 
at 10%. That only applied to landowners and herdsmen who lived inside the Holy Land of Israel. That brings us to the widow's might. The widow was not bringing what she brought as salary for Levites and priests. What the Levite brought, what the widow brought, she placed into the treasure chest inside the women's court in the temple. And that treasure chest was not destined for salaries for Levites and priests. That treasure chest was for the poor and for temple maintenance. And most likely when she left the temple, she also brought, was given more money from that chest because she was a poor widow. Therefore, it is wrong to, to use the widow's might as an example of tithing. The widow was giving a free will offering and her gift was accepted by God. Not because it was a tithe, not because she was giving her all, but because she was giving... Essay point number 11. Tithes were commonly used as political taxes. Tithes were commonly used as political taxes. Have you ever asked yourself the question, what did the Levites in the Old Covenant do to deserve receiving the whole first tithe? What did the Levites in the Old Covenant actually do to deserve receiving the tithe? Well, I doubt that you will ever hear a sermon on this, but for other than for myself. But in Numbers chapter 3, we are told that the Levites who received the tithe, they were the tent makers, they were the carpenters, they were the artisans, they were the fabric weavers, they were the animal skinners, they were the, the, the janitorial service, and this is what the Levites did to deserve the tithe in the Old Covenant before the temple was built. In First Chronicles chapters 23 to 26, Four chapters are, de are devoted to the duties of the Levites and priests who received the tithe. There were simply too many Levites and priests, and David and Solomon took a, a census. There were 38,000 Levites, men, older males, available to work in the temple. And the Bible tells us in 1 Chronicles chapter 23 that 24,000 of these Levites in Solomon's temple were builders. They were supervisors. They were the skilled craftsmen who knew how to build the temple of God for Solomon. They were not the priests. They were not the ministers. And they were the recipients of the tithe. If you're going to supervise a skill, you have to know the skill. Therefore, somewhere, somehow, sometime, the Levites spent an awful lot of their time learning ordinary trades and crafts. They did not work as full-time ministers in the gospel, and they received the tithes. The Bible tells us in 1 Chronicles 23 that 6,000 of the Levites were civil and religious rulers. They were judges. They worked a dual position. They, were, they worked in the temple as religious leaders and they also worked for the king as political leaders. And you have to, you have to admit that as political leaders what the Levites received called tithing has to be called a tax. And there is no reason to just keep on and on saying that tithes were not taxes in the Old Testament. In 1 Chronicles chapter 26, the Bible says, verse 30, They were in all the business of the Lord and in the service of the king. And the next verse says that they did the duty of the king and the duty 
of the religious leaders. It was a dual job. But David used the Levites to be his judges, his rulers in Israel during the construction and afterwards of the temple. It is equally important to realize what tithing was never used for in the Old Testament. Unfortunately, but true, tithes in the Old Testament were never used for missionary work. They were never used to build mission stations. They were never used to proselytize the Gentiles, to convert the Gentiles to the Old Covenant, to their way of living. Tithing was not used to support missionaries in the Old Testament. And sound good as it may, it is not biblical to take tithe, to say we are collecting tithes to support missionaries in the New Covenant. It sounds good, but it is not a biblical concept. In the Old Covenant, the prophets were usually the greater spokesmen for God, not the Levites, not the priests, not the ministers. The prophets were. And the prophets did not receive tithes for a living. If you study the Word of God and look at the prophets, those who were not Levites and priests were either self-supporting or they lived under as recipients of free will offerings. And it is the prophets and not the priests who more closely resemble the new covenant concept of pastors and preachers and bishops and elders and New Testament leaders. Essay point number 12. Levitical tithes were usually taken to the Levitical cities. Levitical tithes were usually taken to the Levitical cities. Contrary to what you hear from the pulpits in the land today, very little of the tithe ever reached the temple storehouse in Jerusalem. That is because of what the Bible teaches about the Levitical cities and the 24 courses of Levites and priests. According to Numbers chapter 35, Joshua chapters 20 and 21, and 1 Chronicles chapter 6, and many, many other references to the Levitical cities, the priests and the Levites did not live in Jerusalem to serve at the temple all of the time. In fact, there were originally 48 Levitical cities established in the Old Covenant. Judah had 13 of them. And the Levites and priests lived in those Levitical cities. Numbers chapter 35, verses 2 and 3. Command the children of Israel that they give unto the Levites of the inheritance of their possession cities to dwell in. And ye shall give also unto the Levites suburbs for the cities round about them. And the cities shall they have to dwell in, and the suburbs of them shall be for their cattle, and for their goods, and for all their beasts. For their cattle, for their goods, and for all their beasts. Friends, it is a false teaching to say that the Levites and priests were full-time workers in the temple in Jerusalem. In fact, the great majority of the time, they were raising cattle and other items, other animals that had been given to them as tithes, and they were learning skills to use in the temple. In Nehemiah chapter 10, verse 37b, I have discovered the most amazing text in all the Bible dealing with the Levitical cities. And I doubt that you've ever heard a sermon upon it. Nehemiah 10, 37, the second half. Read it with me. And the tithes of the ground bring unto the Levites that the same Levites might have the tithes, where? In all the cities of our tillage. In all the cities of our tillage. We looked at this earlier. 
the people were commanded to bring the first fruit to the temple, to the priest, to the storehouse, to be eaten in the temple by those who were there serving. On the other hand, the people were commanded to bring the tithes to the Levitical cities, not to the temple, to the Levites and to the priests where they lived. And the Levites and priests were responsible for bringing the tithe as they needed it up to the temple when they served there to minister their turn. Speaking of their turn, the 24 courses of Levites and priests is another reason to, to doubt the definition or the usual interpretation of Malachi 3 verse 10. There were 24 courses of Levites and priests. And I mentioned before, David and Solomon realized that there were just too many of them to serve in the temple at any one time. So they divided them into 24 families. And each family would normally come up to the temple to minister the older males one week out of 24, which is about two weeks a year, not counting the festival times. One week in 24 is about 4%. And if you leave out the, the women, the daughters, the wives, the daughters, and the younger males, at the very most, there are only 2% left. So at the very most, only 2% of the total population of the Levites and priests were at the temple serving any normal time, a week at a time. Therefore, the question is, why would God tell us in Malachi 3.10 to bring 100% of the tithe to the temple storehouse when 98% of those whom the tithe was destined and designated to feed were not at the temple to eat it? It doesn't make sense. Why would God tell Israel to bring 100% of the tithe to the temple to be eaten when 98% of those who needed to eat it were not at the temple. There is something seriously wrong with the typical interpretation of Malachi chapter 3, verse 10. Essay point number 13. Malachi 3, 8 through 10 is the most abused tithing text in the Bible. Malachi 3, 8 through 10 is the most abused tithing text in the Bible. There's a verse we need to look at that sets the context for the book of Malachi. That is Nehemiah chapter 10, verse 29. Nehemiah 10, 29. These joined with their brethren, their nobles, and entered into a curse and an oath to walk in God's law which was given by Moses the servant of God, and to observe and do all the commandments of the Lord, our Lord, and his ordinances and his statutes. Nehemiah's audience is Malachi's audience. They are the same people in the same time. We see that the people Nehemiah and Malachi is addressed to as a group repeated the blessings and curses of the entire Mosaic Law. The Bible says they entered into an oath. They took a solemn oath to keep all of the Law of Moses, and if they don't, they would bring a curse upon themselves. And they took a solemn oath that if they violated any of the Law of Moses, that curse would fall, fall upon themselves. The blessings would only come through complete obedience to all of the law. That was the oath and the curse that they called upon themselves in Nehemiah chapter 10. We cannot forget that when we look at the book of Malachi. Malachi begins with God addressing Israel. But six verses down, he changes his address to the priest 
Look at Malachi chapter 1, verse 6. A son honors his father, and a servant his master. If then I be a father, wherein is my honor? If I am a master, wherein is my fear? Says the Lord of hosts unto you, O priest, that despise my name. Unto you, O priest, that despise my name. The main problem I have about Malachi is that most people have never read the four very short chapters. You can read it in a matter of moments. Most preachers do not preach from Malachi. They preach from Malachi chapter 3 verses 8 to 10 and ignore the rest of the book. By doing so, they are teaching error about tithing. They are not teaching the people what Malachi is all about. Beginning in chapter 1, verse 6, the pronoun you is addressed to the priest in Malachi. And that pronoun follows the priest throughout the book of Malachi. Wherever the pronoun you appears in Malachi, it's referring to the priest. God is angry at the priest in Malachi. In chapter 1, verse 8, God says to the priest, You have brought that which was blind, the lame, and the sick to me. In verse 13, he says, You have brought the torn, the lame, and the sick to me. And some of the better versions translate that to say, You have brought to me that which you took by robbery. That's what you have stolen from me. That which you have taken by violence from me. In other words, the priest had taken that which had been given to them as a tithe and an offering, and they had vowed to give God the very best of those items given to them as tithes and offerings, and they had lied, they had stolen it, they had kept it for themselves, they had given God the worst. The priests are guilty of stealing from God. Verse 13 makes it even clearer. But cursed is the deceiver who has in his flock a male and vows and sacrifices unto the Lord a corrupt thing. This is the first time the word curse occurs in the book of Malachi. And God is cursing the priest. Not because the people had not brought the tithe to him, because they had. The text says, who has in his flock. The priest had that perfect, good, healthy, sacrificial animal because the people had brought their tithe. And instead, the priest had vowed to give it to God and turned around and gave it and kept it for themselves and gave God the sick and the lame and the blind. And God cursed them because of it. There is another example of the priest stealing the tithe, and that is found in Nehemiah chapter 13, verses 5 through 10. In chapters 10, 11, 11 and 12, the people had been bringing their tithes to the priests, to the Levitical cities. Nehemiah goes to Babylon for a few months, and while he's gone, the high priest Eliashib, we are told, takes the tithes out of the storehouse in Jerusalem at the temple, lets, the, lets Tobiah the Samaritan move in, the, the Levites are without food to eat, and they go home to their fields. Nehemiah returns, he's extremely angry, he sees the temple has shut down because the Levites have gone. He ejects Tobiah from the storehouse, has an emergency restocking of tithes, and the Levites come back. In verse 10 we read, And I perceived that the portions of the Levites had not been given them, because the Levites and the singers that did the work were fled every one to his field. The priest had stolen the Levites portion of the tithe. The portions are the tithes. 
the, the priests were able to eat the, the first fruit and the tithes, but the Levites were only allowed to eat from the tithes. And the text does not say the priest had nothing to eat and went home. The text says the Levites had nothing to eat and left. Therefore, we must conclude that the priest under Elisha the high priest had stolen the Levites' portion of the tithe, causing the temple to close down. And it is very possible that this is the context of Malachi chapter 3, verses 8 to 10. Back to Malachi chapter 2, verse 1. And now, O ye priests, this commandment is for you. And now, O ye priests, this commandment is for you. In case you missed it the first time in chapter 1, verse 6, God says it again, that he is addressing the priest. Oh, the you refers to you priest and not the nation of Israel. God is very angry at the priest. In verse 2, look at verse 2. Look at verse 2. If you will not hear, and if you will not lay it to heart, to give glory unto my name, says the Lord of hosts, I will even send a curse upon you, and I will curse your blessings. Yes, I have cursed them already, because you do not lay it to heart. The word curse occurs three more times in this verse, and it is addressed to the priests, not to the people. Therefore, four out of four times thus far in Malachi, the word curse appears. It is referring to the priest whom God is cursing. In the next verse, chapter 2, verse 3, God says, I will throw dung in your faces at your feast. That's quite angry, isn't it? In verse 8, God tells the priest that they had violated, they had broken the covenant of Levi, that unique, that special covenant that God made only with the priest, the covenant of Levi. Therefore, the word covenant in, in the book of Malachi refers back to the covenant of Levi and not the old covenant in itself. In verses 11 and 12, there's a digression. God, for the first time addresses somebody other than priest in Malachi. But you notice it is to the people of Judah and it is third person. It is the they, not the you. And does not and immediately God goes back the very next verse, verse 13, to uh, condemning the priest again for their disobedience. Therefore we have this conversation in Malachi. It's always a two-way two conversation. The priests are mocking God, and God is condemning and cursing the priests. Chapter 2 ends with the priest asking God a question. Where is the God of judgment? God is not going to judge us. They are mocking him. They really didn't want an answer. They had gotten away with everything they had, all the sin they had committed up to this point. And evidently, since they've gotten away with it, they assume that God is not going to judge them. Where is the God of judgment? And chapter 3 opens with God answering their question. He says, I will send my messenger to his temple. Many of us have heard this referring to Jesus going to the temple and overturning the, te the, the tables of money changers, which is an application which is accurate. But the primary application of this text, I believe, is to Nehemiah himself. In Nehemiah chapter 13, it is Nehemiah that cleansed the priesthood that went to the temple and ejected those who are not qualified to be priests in Israel. Chapter 3, verse 2. Like a refiner's fire and like the fuller's soap, he shall purify the sons of Levi and purge them. 
God's anger has been toward the priests, and now when they said words to God of judgment, God says, I'm going to judge you priests. Like fire and like soap. He's going to cleanse the priesthood. He's not angry at the people. He's angry at the priests. Verse 5 says, And I will come near to you in judgment. You see, that's a, that's a, a priestly term, coming near to God. Only the priests were allowed in the Old Covenant to draw near to God. And now God says, I'm going to draw near to you to judge you. And verse 6 mentions the sons of Jacob. And everybody says, oh, now he's talking to all of Israel. Not necessarily. The, the, the priests, the Levites, were sons of Jacob also. Just because God says this is for you sons of Jacob doesn't mean he's talking to all of Israel because they were equally sons of Jacob. That brings us to Malachi chapter 3 verses 8 to 10. The most often quoted text on tithing in the word of God. Will a man rob God? Yet you have robbed me. But you say, wherein have we robbed you? In tithes and offerings. You are cursed with a curse. For you have robbed me even this whole nation. Bring ye all the tithes into the storehouse. That there may be food in my house. I ask you, up until this point, who has God been angry with for robbing him? Not the people, the priest. Chapter 1, verse 14, God says the priest had that which was good in their flock. God has not one time condemned the people for robbing him in the book of Malachi up until now. Second, who had the pro who has the pronoun you referred to? You have robbed me. So far, the pronoun you in the book of Malachi has always referred to the priest. And I think to be consistent, it still refers to the priest. Point number three. You have robbed me in tithes and offerings. They had taken the best of the tithe and vowed to give it to God and instead kept it for themselves and God had cursed them for this. In chapter 1, verse 14, chapter 2, verse 2. And while we're at it, why do people say that you have to give a tithe first and only after you give a tithe is it an offering? Where is that taught in the Word of God? This text merely says that you have robbed me in tithes and offerings. Tithes, in my opinion, refers to those who qualify as tithe payers, the landowners and the herdsmen and the farmers. Whereas offering applies to everybody, the craftsmen, the tradesmen, and those who earn their occupation off the land. And yet, both of these categories had brought their tithes and their offerings to the priests, and the offerings instead had been, the best of them had been kept by the priest, and the priests had stolen the best from God, which they had vowed to give him. Who has been cursed up until this point? The priest have four times. Chapter 1, verse 14. Chapter 2, verse 2. And now all of a sudden we are led to believe that now God is angry at the people of Israel and he feels sorry for the priest. That now all of a sudden the priest don't have the tithe because the people had not brought it. That is inconsistent with the rest of the chapter and in his poor principles of interpretation. You have to look at what leads up to this verse. The text says, you have robbed me, this whole nation. The King James says, this whole nation. The New American Standard, the RSV, the NIV, the better translations add, of you. This whole nation of you. And here again, people want to say, now he's talking about the whole nation of Israel. Israel. 
not if he's talking about this whole nation of you priests. The word you refers to priests, the whole nation of you priests. Every priest in the nation had been guilty of keeping the best for themselves and robbing God. There are nine reasons why Malachi should be interpreted differently than it is ter interpreted today. I believe that Malachi chapter 3 verse 10, bringing all the tithes into the storehouse, only refers to the dishonest priest who had stolen the best of the tithes and offerings that the people had given to them. These are my reasons. Number one, Malachi is not is an old covenant Malachi is an old covenant book and does not refer to Christians under the new covenant. Number two, Malachi is addressed to the dishonest priest. The you refers to the priest. Malachi is not addressed to the church or even to the rest of Israel, in my opinion. But we know it's not addressed to the church. Number three, in Malachi 3, tithes are still only food. This is 1,000 years after the tithing definition was given in Leviticus 27, and it still does not include money. Tithes are still only food. Number four, the Levitical cities must be interpreted in any, any explanation of Malachi 3.10, and they are not. Most of the Levites and priests did not stay in Jerusalem most of the time. Number five, the 24 courses and families of priests and Levites must be included in an interpretation of Malachi 3.10. And they are not. Only 2% normally served at the most at the temple any one time. Number six, the nature of the curses and blessings of the Mosaic law must be included in an interpretation of Malachi 3.10, and they're not. You cannot take the blessings and cursings of tithing out of the rest of the law and have it make sense. You cannot tithe and break the rest of the law and be blessed. You cannot keep the rest of the law and not tithe and be blessed. It doesn't work that way. That is poor interpretation of the Word of God. It is poor hermeneutics. It acts like tithing stands by itself and the rest of the law has no relevance to tithing when it comes to the Christian church. Number seven. The priests were cursed for stealing. The priests were cursed four times for stealing before Malachi chapter 3. And to be consistent, God is still cursing the priest for stealing and not the people. Number 8. Nehemiah chapter 10 verse 37 must be included in a correct interpretation of Malachi 3.10, and it's not. The text says that the people brought the tithes to the Levites and priests in the Levitical cities, and it was only the responsibility of the Levites and priests to bring the tithes up from the cities into the storehouse. Therefore, Malachi 3.10 has not been correctly interpreted by the church even in the context of the Old Covenant. My conclusion is that Malachi 3.10 must refer only to dishonest priests who had stolen the tithe and were being told to replace it. Once again, the only explanation that makes sense in the light of these nine reasons is that Malachi 3.10, bringing all the tithes into the storehouse, only refers to the priest who had stolen the tithe and were, told, were being told to replace it. Essay point number 14. Tithing is not taught to the church in the New Testament. Tithing is not taught to the church in the New Testament. 
what we need here is a consistent principle of interpretation that allows us to move material from the Old Testament into the New Testament and have it stand there in a legitimate, for a legitimate reason. I like the way that Martin Luther and John Calvin did it. Martin Luther taught that in the old law, under the Mosaic Covenant, unless it was an eternal moral principle, something that went beyond the law, it was not to be brought into the New Covenant. And those items that were strictly cultic ceremonial statutes of the Old Covenant law were not to be brought into the New Testament. Therefore, Martin Luther rejected tithing. Matthew 23, 23 reads, Woe unto you, scribes and Pharisees, hypocrites! For you pay tithe of mint and anise and cumin, and have omitted the weightier matters of the law, judgment, mercy, and faith. These you ought to have done, not to have left the other undone. I ask you to look at the text and ask yourself, was Jesus talking about something in the Old Covenant or something in the New Covenant? Was Jesus discussing matters that solely belonged to the Mosaic Law or matters that belonged to the church also? Is the church being addressed in Matthew 23, 23? The text itself says very plainly that Jesus is talking to the scribes and Pharisees. Woe unto you, scribes and Pharisees, hypocrites! They were hypocrites because they were the accepted interpreters of the law in the first century in Jesus' day and age, and they had abused the law and made it a burden instead of a joy for Jewish Christians and other Jews under the law. The text says that the Pharisees and scribes taught that we should be, that the those under the law should tithe mint and anise and cumin. These were small garden herbs, spices, that were normally grown on the back porch or in the backyard. And they were not, not included in the original interpretation of what tithing was supposed to include in the Old Covenant. Matters of the Law. Matthew 23, 23 clearly says that Jesus was discussing matters of the law. And those who teach tithing, when, when they quote this verse, very often leave out those four words in order to make it appear that Jesus was given instruction to the New Covenant Church when he was not. Jesus was born under the jurisdiction of the law. He lived under the jurisdiction of the law. Jesus died that he might redeem those under the law. And in doing so, he redeemed everybody else also. The context of Matthew 23, 23 is found in the first three verses. Jesus says, he spoke to the multitude and to his disciples, saying, the scribes and the Pharisees sit in Moses' seat. Therefore, do everything they tell you to observe. Jesus was speaking to his Jewish disciples, those under the law, about the hypocrisy of the scribes and Pharisees. He was not instructing the church on how to run its matters, its affairs. Jesus made it plain why the Jewish disciples should obey the scribes and Pharisees because the text says that they sit in Moses' seat. Because they sit in Moses' seat. And in no way whatsoever does this mean they are authoritative as teachers for the Christian church. Therefore, that is why Jesus said you should obey what they tell you to do.
In Matthew 5, 24, Jesus said, First be reconciled to your brother, and then come and offer your gift. In Matthew 8, verse 4, Jesus said, Show yourself to the priest, and offer the gift that Moses commanded for a testimony unto them. Jesus could legitimately, under the law, tell his Jewish disciples to go to the temple when he had healed them or when they had a dispute among themselves and show themselves to the priest. But Jesus could not tell his Gentile disciples whom he had just healed to go to the temple. Neither could Jesus tell his Gentile disciples to pay tithes because they would not have been accepted even if they had attempted to do so. But you ask, what about Acts chapter 2 and Acts chapter 4? Aren't these examples of tithing in the early church? My answer is no. If you're honest with the text, you will admit that Acts chapter 2 and Acts chapter 4 are examples, first of all, of communal living, and second of all, of free will offerings to the very best. In those chapters, everybody gave everything they had into a communal pot, and it was laid at the feet of the disciples, of, of the, the apostles, those who were the leaders of the church. They were not giving tithes and offerings, they were putting into the community chest. And the early apostles, the Bible says, equally distributed them among everybody in the church as they had need. This is not an example of tithing, nor is it an example of what any church that I know of practices today. Yet these texts are used to say, yes, the early church taught tithing. Turn with me to Acts chapter 21, verses 20 and 21, and look at the text. Look, brother, how many thousands of Jews there are which believe, and they are all zealous of the law. And they are informed that you are teaching all the Jews which are among the Gentiles to forsake Moses. Acts chapter 21 is 30 years after Calvary. Yet the Jewish Christian church in Jerusalem had been taken over by the legalizers, the Judaizers, those Pharisees who said the law was all important. And it is evident from this text and the preceding events the pre that these people we're still supporting the law in every area. The text says they are all zealous of the law. And friend, if you're honest with the verse, you have to conclude that if these Christians were tithing at all, they were tithing to the Levitical system and not to early church leaders and apostles. Otherwise, they would not have been accepted in the Jewish sanctuary when they went to worship, if they were not bringing their tithes to the Levitical system. Therefore, Acts 20, 21, verse 20 and 21, in my opinion, prove beyond a shadow of a doubt, 30 years after Calvary, that the early church was not paying tithes to the apostles and the early church leaders. Essay point number 15. The Old Covenant priesthood was replaced by the priesthood of all believers. The Old Covenant priesthood was replaced by the priesthood of all believers. The church today, by its actions, seems to want its members to believe that the Old Covenant priests have been replaced by New Covenant pastors, preachers, elders, and bishops. And in doing so, they seem to play down 
the reality that the new covenant priest had really been replaced by the priesthood of every believer. Every function that was performed by the old covenant priest is today performed not by preachers and pastors and ministers and elders and bishops, but by you and I, the body of Christ, because of the doctrine of the priesthood of every believer. Look at the history of this doctrine. Look with me now to Exodus chapter 19, verses 5 and 6. If you will obey my voice indeed, and keep my covenant, then you shall be a peculiar treasure unto me, and you shall be unto me a kingdom of priests and a holy nation. These are the words which you shall speak unto the children of Israel. Exodus 19, of course, is the chapter before Exodus 20, where the Ten Commandments are given, and Exodus 21, where the remainder of the law is given. Exodus 19 takes place before the incident of the golden of the calves, the golden calves, where Israel sinned, and only the tribe of Levi stepped across the line to serve Moses. In Exodus 19, we see God's purpose for Israel had they not sinned and had they kept their covenant with him. And his purpose was that every person in the nation would be a priest. They would be a peculiar treasure, a kingdom of priests. But that did not happen. After the incident of the golden calves, Levi was chosen as the only priestly tribe and tithing was instituted, was taken, the tithes were taken from the other 11 tribes to support the Levites because they were not allowed to own property. Turn with me now to 1 Peter chapter 2, verse 9. But you are a chosen generation, a royal priesthood, a holy nation, a peculiar people, that you should show forth the praises of him who has called you out of darkness into his marvelous light. You can't help but see that Peter is quoting Exodus 19, 5 and 6. And he is not addressing the apostles or the pastors or the elders of the Christian church. He is addressing the church as a whole, the ecclesia, the assembly, the believers before him. And Peter is using Exodus 19, 5 and 6 to show that the purpose of God has now been fulfilled not by the preachers, but by every individual believer. And this is where we get the doctrine of the priesthood of believers. You and I are now in the shoes of the old covenant priest. And the conclusion that I reach and I think it is valid, is that since the old covenant priests and Levites were supported by tithing because of the sin of Israel, and now because you and I have replaced that priesthood, that tithing has also been replaced in the new covenant. Essay point number 16. The new covenant church is neither a building nor a storehouse. The New Covenant Church is neither a building nor a storehouse. Yet somehow preachers today seem to have forgotten what has happened to the temple in the Old Covenant. In the New Covenant, the temple of God is not a building. The temple of God is within the believer. Those who have been born again, who have accepted Jesus Christ as their personal Lord and Savior, have been bought with a price. We are not our own. Our body now belongs to God. And the Holy Spirit indwells the individual believer. And the temple of God is now within the believer. 
And if you think about it, in the Old Covenant, the temple of God held the storehouse that held the tithes and offerings. In the New Covenant, the temple of God is within the believer, and the idea of the storehouse is gone. It's not in the New Covenant at all. In fact, history proves that the early church did not even have buildings to worship in for over 200 years after Calvary. The word church is the word ecclesia, the assembly, the called out ones. It is the body of Christ. It is not a building nor a storehouse in the New Covenant. New Covenant Christians do not go to church to worship. New Covenant Christians assemble the body to worship. There is only one text in the New Testament that might possibly refer to uh, a storehouse, and that is interpreted, in my opinion, interpreted wrong. In 1 Corinthians 16, verse 2, there is a Greek word, thesarizo, which is interpreted to lay by in, in store, to store up. But the context of verse 1 says concerning the collection for the saints. The, the storing up in verse 2 has nothing to do whatsoever with tithing to support church leaders. Rather, Paul is telling the, those residents in Asia Minor, around Ephesus in the area, to store up food at home for famine relief in Judea. And when Paul arrived there on ship, they would gather the, the food from their homes to put on board the ship to send to the famine. And this is the meaning of store up in 1 Corinthians 16 too. Yet over and over, I see text, I see tithing booklets, and I hear tithing preachers quote this text to say, yes, the old covenant, the new covenant church taught tithing, and the church is the storehouse. Friends, that is definitely not a biblical doctrine. Essay point number 17. The church grows by using better New Covenant principles. The church grows by using better New Covenant principles. In Hebrews chapter 7, verse 5, we find a very peculiar verse. And they that are of the sons of Levi who receive the office of the priesthood, have a commandment to take tithes of the people according to the law. Look at the verse. It is the first time in Hebrews the word law, the word commandment, and the word tithes occur. All in the same verse at the same point in the book of Hebrews. And we must remember the context of those three words as we follow the discussion in Hebrews chapter 7. In verse 10, we're told that, yes, uh, Melchizedek was greater than Abraham and Aaron because they tithed to Melchizedek. But the text is not teaching tithing. The text is a vehicle there merely used to point out that Melchizedek was superior to Aaron, and therefore it, the, it is implied that the Aaronic priesthood must come to an end. That is why tithing is used in, in Hebrews chapter 7. In verse 12, we read, For the priesthood being changed, there is made of necessity a change also of the law. The law must be changed because the priesthood is about to go out. And the priesthood is about to go out because Psalm 110 prophesied that the Messiah would follow the priesthood of Melchizedek and not the priesthood of Aaron. The text does not say that tithing was to be changed and taken away from the Aaronic priesthood and given to the Melchizedek, Melchizedek priesthood. 
The text does not say that at all. It merely says that the, it is necessary to change the law. The law found in Numbers chapter 18, the law of tithes and offerings that supported the Levitical priesthood. In Hebrews chapter 7, there's the, the argument says that Jesus was from the tribe of Judah. And Moses said nothing in the law about a priest coming from Judah. Therefore, you cannot use anything that supported the Aaronic priesthood to support the priesthood of Jesus Christ. There again, tithing is included. And the text goes on to say that not only was Jesus from the tribe of, tribe of Judah, which the law did not comment on, but Jesus is a priest after the order of Melchizedek. And the law definitely says nothing about supporting a, a priest after the order of Melchizedek. Hebrews chapter 7, verse 18 for there is a disannulling of the commandment going before because of its weakness and uselessness. The King James says unprofitableness. The text does not say that the commandment was changed from supporting the Aaronic priesthood to supporting the Melchizedek priesthood. The text says the, the change was a complete disannulling of the law an abolishment of it, a setting aside of it. The law of tithes and offerings in Numbers 18 that allowed the Levitical priesthood to exist has been totally abolished in the New Covenant by the priesthood of Jesus Christ. Why, we ask? Well, Hebrews 7.19 tells us, because the law made nothing perfect. But the bringing in of a better hope did, by which we draw near or nigh unto God. Tithing failed. The Levitical system failed. The priesthood of Aaron failed. It, the law made nothing perfect or mature or grown up. The law did not spiritually mature Israel to fulfill God's purposes, and it was replaced by a better hope by which we draw near to God. You see, under the old law, only the priest could draw near unto God. But under the new law, every believer, as a priest and even as a high priest, can draw, boldly enter into the presence of God. And remember, the law also failed because tithing in the old law never produced missionaries or mission stations. Tithing was never used in the old covenant to sustain mission work for anybody. And if it's not an old covenant principle, it, although it sounds good, I said before, it sounds good, but you cannot say, well, tithing was used in the old covenant to send out missionaries, therefore tithing should be used in the new covenant to send out missionaries, because tithing was not used that way in the old covenant. Essay point number 18. The Apostle Paul preferred that church leaders be self-supporting. The Apostle Paul preferred that church leaders be self-supporting. In 1 Corinthians chapter 9, Paul is defending his right to receive limited support from the church in Corinth. And he uses some examples. He uses the example of a soldier, of a farmer, of a herdsman, of a grinding ox, and of temple workers from verses 7 to, 4, to 13. And the principle Paul is trying to teach here is that each vocation, each calling provides a limited amount 
at least of support for those in that calling. Those who teach tithing want to make the principal say something else. They want to make the principal that Paul is arguing say that the Bible teaches that gospel workers should be full-time workers. And that is not true because even the Levites and priests in the Old Testament were not full-time workers in the temple. And second, they want the text to say the gospel workers must be supported by tithes and offerings, just as the old covenant workers were supported by tithes and offerings. Yet, if that is the principle that Paul is laying down here, he is guilty of violating his own principle. In verse 12, Paul says, if others share the right over you, do we not more? Nevertheless, we do not use this right, but we endure all things so that we will cause no hindrance to the gospel of Christ. Having laid down his principles, Paul then says, I do not intend to use even a portion of my right. I have a right to a limited, at least a limited support from the church, but I do not intend to use that right and I have not used that right. Paul said in verse 14, but those who preach the gospel should live of the gospel. And the word for live here is the Greek word zoe. Zoe is a lifestyle. It's not a salary. It's not a wage. It's not a payment for services rendered. Paul says those who preach the gospel should live a lifestyle of gospel, of gospel principles. Those who worked in the temple followed law principles. Those who worked in the gospel follow principles of grace and faith, the principles of the new covenant laid down by the Holy Spirit. Remember the ox that was grinding. Only received only receive the double honor of eating while it was grinding. When it was not grinding, it did not have that honor. And that illustration goes to the other. The others also. The soldiers, when they want to a battle were able to partake of the spoils of war of that battle but the text is not saying again that the principle is that new covenant workers should be paid from no old covenant principles of law in Matthew chapter 10 and Luke chapter 10 Jesus sends out the 12 and the 70 they are on a mission. They are working as evangelists to spread the gospel. And they are not collecting tithes and offerings. And, and just the opposite, they are living as the poorest of the land, but they are living being sustained by those whom they serve. And if Matthew 10 and Luke 10 are being referred to in 1 Corinthians 9, 14, then again there is no grounds for saying that these are examples of tithing in the early church. In verse 15, Paul says, But I have used none of these things, neither have I written these things, that it should be done so unto me. For it were better for me to die than that my, any man should make my glory in void. After listing these seven examples of principles, Paul says, I have not used any of them, and I don't intend to use any of them. How can they be a, a decree of Jesus Christ if Paul was vi uh, deliberately violating what was supposed to be the word of God, the word of Jesus, that he ordained the church to live on tithes and offerings? That does not make sense, my friend. 
Paul is going to the opposite extreme and boasting that he would rather die than follow that principle. In verse 18, he says, where is my reward, my salary, my, my paycheck, my mistos, the Greek word? Verily that when I preach the gospel, I may make the gospel of Christ without charge that I abuse not my power. Paul said that his salary, his recompense, his paycheck for preaching the gospel was that he could do it for free, without charge. When is the last time you heard a sermon quoting this text and saying, the person saying, I want to be just like Paul? I want to look at Acts chapter 20 now. In Acts chapter 20, is at the end of Paul's third missionary journey, 30 years after Calvary. He boasts that he'd been at Ephesus for three years, and during that three years, they had provided absolutely nothing of his support. Not only Paul, Paul not only said that the church had not supported him, but he had also supported those who were with him. And then Paul takes it out of the arena of his opinion and puts it into the arena of what he thinks must be done. Acts 20, verse 35. In everything I showed you, that by working hard in this manner, you must help the weak and remember the words of the Lord Jesus that he himself said, it is more blessed to give than to receive. Somewhere Jesus had said this, and it was not recorded elsewhere in the Word, that it is more blessed to give than to receive. And Paul understands Jesus to be talking to his apostles or church leaders or the shepherds he would send out. And Paul understands Jesus to be saying to church leaders that you should work hard, and he's not talking about preaching the gospel, by working hard in this manner, you must help the weak. So he takes it out of the arena of his opinion and puts it into the arena of what he thinks church leaders must do. I'm not against full-time pastors, and I don't think Paul was. But we are both against the idea that the Bible teaches that preachers of the gospel must be full-time. And we are both against the idea that the Bible teaches that preachers of the gospel must be supported by tithing. Neither of those are biblical principles, and they're not found in the New Covenant either. Second Corinthians chapter 12, verse 14, has this same idea. I will not be burdensome to you, for I seek not yours, but you. For the children ought not to lay up for the parents, but the parents for the children. And I will very gladly spend and be spent for you. Paul is speaking to the church that could afford to support him with tithes and offerings. Paul is speaking to the church that had money, the church in Corinth. And yet, speaking to this wealthy church, he says, I am your spiritual father. And common sense says that the parents, the fathers, should take care of the children and not the other way around. So Paul is telling the church in Corinth that he is going to work to take care of their needs, their physical needs, the poor and the needy in their church, and he doesn't expect them to take care of his needs. Yet today, the preacher of tithing 
says, give me your tithes as first fruits. I want your money first. God is speaking through me, they say. And only after you tithe your first fruits to me can you take what is left and pay your bills with. Friend, that's a terrible abuse of God's word. That's a terrible abuse of God's people. The word of God does not teach that at all. Essay point number 19. Tithing did not become an enforced law in the church until A.D. 777. Tithing did not become an enforced law in the church until A.D. 777. Those preachers and tithe teachers that tell you that tithing has always been taught in the church are simply wrong. They usually ignore at least the first 300 years of church history. If we look at the writings of Clement of Rome, Justin Martyr, Irenaeus, and Tertullian, who died in A.D. 220, it is clear that these writers looked at tithing as strictly a, a strictly Jewish tradition that had nothing to do with the Christian church. Around A.D. 250, Cyprian in North Africa introduced a type of tithing to try to put it into his churches. He first ordered his other church leaders to stop working for a living, which means they were still earning their living working secular jobs. He then told the people to bring their tithes to the church. But Cyprian's concept of tithing was more like Acts chapter 2 and Acts chapter 4. When the tithes reached the church, they were equally distributed among all church members that had need. And Cyprian made it clear that the church officers were only to take the very bare necessities that they needed to barely live in those days. So even Cyprian's view of tithing is not anywhere near that that is taught in the church today. In AD 325, Christianity became legal. And soon after, some of the church leaders began teaching a their concept of tithing. We see this in the writings of Ambrose and Chrysostom and Augustine. But even these writers followed the, the precedent of the earlier Christian leaders. The idea in those days was asceticism, extreme poverty. The poorer you were, the holier you were. And it was something almost to boast about in the early church as to how poor you were. Tithing has nothing to do with the, the fulfillment of the desires of early church leaders. And even under Ambrose and Augustine, the idea of asceticism lingered and remained in the concept of monasticism. The poor you were, the holier you were. And they loved to quote Jesus, what he said to the rich man, sell all that you have, give to the poor, and you shall have riches in heaven. That was a very often quoted uh, text in the early church. So when did tithing enter the church? Around A.D. 560 and 585, there were two church councils that introduced tithing as a regional law for their region only. And even then it did not spread to the rest of the church and was not enforceable. But even then, we're looking at 500 years past Calvary, and tithing is still not in the early church. It wasn't until A.D. 777 that the Emperor Charlemagne of the Holy Roman Empire first gave civil permission for the church of his day to collect tithes, A.D. 777. 
that's a long time before tithes were ever legitimately introduced into the church. Therefore, tithing has not always existed in the church in early history. I am Russell Earl Kelly. My book is Should the Church Teach Tithing? A Theologian's Conclusions About a Taboo Doctrine. My website is www.shouldthechurchteachtithing.com My email address is russkellyphd at earthlink.net Kelly with one E. And I'd like to close this discussion with one final reading of the principles of giving found in the New Testament. Give yourself to God first. Give yourself to knowing God's will. Give in response to Christ's gift. Give out of a sincere desire. Do not give because of any commandment. Give beyond your ability. Give to produce equality. Many Christians can and should give more than 10%, but many cannot. There is an equality in New Covenant giving principles. It evens out. God blesses both groups equally. Give joyfully. Give because you are growing spiritually. Give because you want to continue growing spiritually. And finally, give because you're hearing the gospel preached. Those are the wonderful, Holy Spirit-blessed giving principles found in 2 Corinthians chapters 8 and 9. May God bless you is my prayer. In Jesus' name, amen.